Welcome to the Resources for Integrated Care webinar series on member engagement. This podcast is excerpted from a webinar presented live in the summer of 2015 called Hard to Reach Populations, Innovative Strategies to Engage Isolated Individuals with Behavioral Health Needs. This webinar series is presented by the Lewin Group in collaboration with Community Catalyst and is supported through the Medicare-Medicaid Coordination Office in the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. MMCO is dedicated to ensuring beneficiaries enrolled in Medicare and Medicaid have access to seamless, high-quality health care that includes the full range of covered services in both programs. To support providers in their efforts to deliver more integrated, coordinated care to Medicare and Medicaid enrollees, MMCO is developing technical assistance and actionable tools based on successful innovations and care models. To learn more about current efforts, please visit resourcesforintegratedcare.com. In this podcast, Lori Lockert, Health Resilience Program Manager at Care Oregon, shares strategies used by her organization to engage hard-to-reach populations through the creative use of data, stronger community partner relationships, and community outreach staff. Thanks very much. Um, that was really interesting to hear, and, and I certainly connect with some of your lessons learned. Um, there are some similarities, <laughs> definitely, in the work we're doing and what we're finding out. Um, next slide. Let me, um, since Bill already introduced a little bit about my background, let me just get started with um, uh, the program that I'm managing. Care Oregon's Health Resilience Program um, has been in existence about four years now. We started out at Care Oregon, and in the first year, we um, after the first year that Care Oregon had said we want to do this, we want to help our members and the providers out in the community, um, we applied for and were awarded, as Bill said, a CMI grant, um, which has supported our growth and learning and development over the past three years. So we just came off that uh, June 30th of this year. Kerrigan is the largest uh, Medicaid-serving plan in Oregon, and you can see the numbers here, with a small amount of uh, Medicare and dual members. The the, um, Health Resilience Program is a trauma-informed program, and I highlight that, uh, and we'll talk more about that um, and why that is uh, the focus of our 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 work and our intervention. We have 30 direct service staff embedded in 23 clinics and uh, one specialty clinic. Uh, We we also started out with trying to embed someone in an emergency room but uh, didn't have uh, the success that Julia's had. So we quickly moved to how can we support our members getting access to and building relationships with their primary care providers. we also have the struggle of working across five healthcare systems, um, which is five different, at least, uh, EHRs, <laughs> five different uh, methods of, do- of approaches. Uh, we serve the most high-risk, complex patients in our program who have avoidable utilization. And the criteria is at the bottom um, of one or more non-OB hospital admissions with or without ED visits within 12 months or six or more ED visits with or without a hospitalization within 12 months. Uh, Let me back up just a minute to further clarify. I'm sure many of you already know about trauma-informed care. But when I say that, um, it means that we're operating with a, the four values or fundamentals of trauma-informed care, transparency, offering choices, empowerment, and working in collaboration. And we do that both with our clients and our providers. So that is one of the main driver of our uh, approach to working with the systems. We know that drivers of utilization for this population are usually multiple psychosocial issues and uh, a a huge amount of trauma history in the background of um, the people we work with. As the research demonstrated uh, with people who have trauma histories, they have a difficult time trusting others, especially authority figures. 
And we see that played out, as I'm sure you do, over and over again in, in trying to build a relationship with someone in a few minutes in a primary care setting. Our initial focus has uh, been on establishing a trusting rela relationship with someone as quickly as possible. And we tend to work with people about six to nine months. Uh, the, the 30 staff typically have a caseload around 20 to 25 uh, clients. As I said earlier, we are embedded in primary care and in collaboration with them. So we have our health resilience specialist become a member of that team. We um, do most of our work outside the four, four walls of the clinic and, um, and walk with the patient in their world, really letting them know that we understand the struggles that they have. We can then bring that information back to the clinic and it has uh, really helped providers get a much deeper understanding of why their treatment plans aren't working and, and where the gaps are. Um, because most of these members do not feel comfortable talking about uh, deficits or deficit skills that they don't have. They don't understand English. They don't understand the treatment plan. They don't understand their medications. Uh, we work with adults and um, we based our utilization criteria on care organs members. Every community has a different profile. And so we're specifically looking at our members. And what we found was that most of these members with high utilization that are not getting the care they need have at least two or more chronic medical conditions as well as mental health and addiction issues, as Julie said. We saw almost immediately the need for a triage coordinator. When I talk about case, uh, case finding, I'll talk more about that. We hired our staff for their engagement skills. <laughs> They're good at building trust and engaging people. We found early on they were not so good at doing case finding. So, um, so we, we shifted gears and hired people who were very good at sifting through uh, daily ED and inpatient reports that come to Care Oregon and then finding referrals for our staff and getting it out to them. Next slide, please. The next slide shows you just a, a, a current snapshot of the number of people we've served since the beginning of the program. The uh, CMI grant required us, as I said, to focus predominantly on the Medicaid population with, um, with some duels that we were helping. When the grant ended June 30th of this year, we were able to now ramp up our focus on our dual members, which were ju in just as much need and had just as many psychosocial barriers as our Medicaid members. Approximately, as you note here, um, two-thirds of those that we encounter and outreach to. And outreach meaning we, hear, we see that you're having problems. We see that in our ED and um, we know you've been going to the hospital. What can we do to help you? So it's a voluntary program. We invite people. And if they want our help, we join with them and start with them where they're at around addressing what they perceive are the health problems that they're having. Next slide, please. The strategies for finding members. Um, we use multiple case finding strategies. Uh, we use utilization and the criteria that I have on the, the first slide. We also um, look at the medical, a deeper dive in talking with the doctor about what's going on medically with this person. So we look at the utilization from claims data and have an eye for, wow, why are they going? This doesn't make sense. They've been to the ED three times for falls. Something's going on there. They were admitted to the hospital for um, their diabetes out of control or their COPD out of control, and they keep going back in for that. Um, those are things that alert us, like detective work. Something's wrong here. We then um, have the health resilience specialist in talking with the doctor, uh, say, let me meet with the person. Let me ask them if they want some help. And then we're able to get into a deeper dive and hear about what the client needs and what they see the problem is with taking care of their health. When we go into a clinic, we at each clinic we do a case finding uh, just through the claims data utilization. And then we sit down with the list of names of uh, clients and meet with the doctors in the clinic and talk about what they see as the problem. 
We work closely with the leadership of the clinic, and that is what really helps give our health resilience specialists the leverage they need and the, the boundaries around their work to target the highest utilizers and the population the clinic's having the most difficult time getting a hold of. Um, we also have the triage coordinators looking at the daily ED reports and giving our staff daily referrals when they see people utilizing or admitted to the hospital, utilizing the ED. That has been much more helpful to our staff, the um, more real-time uh, referral source for them. And finally, once the clinic is understanding the high-risk population management approach, they start becoming the natural providers in the clinic. They're the ones who see what's happening with their patients. They're curious. And so maybe they aren't at that target criteria, but they see them ramping up, and that's very important for us to see and address before the patients become the high utilizers. Uh, we also have uh, one of our supervisors and one of our triage coordinators visiting two shelters where we know homeless members are repeatedly discharged to um, and from the hospital. And then they cycle back into the hospital because they aren't getting the care they need. So once a week, the supervisor and triage coordinator go and meet at the clinic and actually help people know what health plan they have, what insurance, and if they're part of our Care Oregon membership, we do a warm handoff to the health resilience specialist at the clinic they're assigned to. So we make sure they don't get lost. We don't just give them a piece of paper. There's a, an outreach effort made to hold someone's hand, per se, and help them get into the clinic. We finally have the POP Intel Registry, which is not so much a referral, although it does act as a, a referral uh, mechanism for us. The registry was developed during the grant and we saw it as critical to our track each case, uh, each health resilience specialist tracking their clients by a list. Uh, it was also a place to document critical details about the life of the patients, uh, whether it's the ever-changing cell phones, it's where they hang out when they're homeless. They're sort of the psychosocial notes and um, more so boxes uh, because we really wanted to also track our interventions, what we were doing, how many times we were touching people, um, what we were doing with them, where we were doing it. So this is a holder of information that does not necessarily have a, um, the same place in all the different EHRs that our staff um, use at the different hospital clinic, the different systems of care that they're located in. We also can provide details about what triggers a client, how to approach a client, um, so that we can remember to share that if we lose track of the client or, or we need to let someone know. Remember, uh, we, it's best if you approach Fred and ask him about his aunt who he's taking care of. That will really help cement a personal relationship for you. The other thing is given us um, metrics with which to um, provide stakeholders as well as inform our learning around what we're doing with our clients. That's how we know we have a 70% engagement rate. That's how we know we spend about 60% of our time out in the community versus in the clinic. So that has been uh, an, in an incredibly helpful tool for our program. Next slide, please. I've highlighted, um, as Julie also mentioned, hiring the right staff for this work. Um, our intervention is is really about hiring trauma-informed staff, staff who understand how people behave with trauma histories because what we see is that so many of this high-risk population are either getting fired from their primary care clinic, are not going or go once, or aren't telling their providers what's really going on with them. So we feel that being able to recognize those symptoms and help both the provider and the client have a safer visit and be supported in sharing information has been a critical tool for us in our engagement rate. This isn't about simply making contact with patients, but helping them establish and, and build a trust with the primary care provider and that team at their clinic. The other thing is we have time to build a relationship. We do not go in and do an intense uh, intake. It's about doing a lot of, a lot of listening at first. Our staff are primarily master's level in psychology or social work, 
And although they're trained as therapists, they do not do therapy with the patients. They use their therapeutic skills to empower and motivate people to change, to build trust, to be able to give feedback and support to the clients who have many, many skill deficits, as we all know. We don't see this as a quick fix. We I don't even see it as a fix, per se, of anyone's longstanding history. But what we're doing is starting to um, do a reset for these clients and helping them develop a safe relationship with their primary care system or their specialist. We find that people, uh, the staff we've hired, have a background in community mental health. They seem to be best equipped. I, that is my background, and I can appreciate all the work and the clients that we encounter. We're already trained in establishing trusting relationships. We not have knowledge of mental health and addictions treatment as well as symptom, symptomatology. We have cross, cross-cultural training. We have a lot of experience in conversations about boundaries with compassion. We also have a lot of knowledge of local, ever-changing resources. We provide weekly supervision to the staff because we know, um, again, as Julie said, the high rate of burnout in this field um, is well known amongst those of us uh, who have been in it and work in it. And so providing that weekly supervision and support and ideas so that our staff don't get too far down the path of trying to do too much, but more of a high-level systems connectivity and supporting and laying down some future foundation. Again, over and over the staff talk about how important it is to just listen at first. And we've, we share that information with the providers and the clinics. We also get to see by spending our time in the community with the clients, what the, their world actually looks like and how it works. And we can create, uh, we can manage the misperceptions that come up in the primary care clinics around why people aren't showing up, why they aren't cooperating with the treatment, despite the best intentions of the providers. Next slide, please. What is critical is um, for our, our staff is actually, as I said, walking alongside the clients. That builds the relationship so much. We go to appointments with clients if they want us to, but most do because they, they don't understand how the medical system works. We attend specialist appointments. We social service appointments. Um, we help connect people into mental health and addictions treatment. We're teaching communication skills. We're explaining the system to them. We do a lot of translation time around what the provider is saying, what their medical team is saying, and breaking it down so that the staff, so that the clients really understand what it is that they're being told. We know that providers don't have time to spend with people, and so that's where we're an extension for them. And we also know that many providers are really frustrated with these clients. And, and so don't end up uh, listening to them or necessarily treating them that well because they're very frustrated and they're not sure what else they can provide, which is a really normal thing to have happen. So we found that we have become really uh, a support to the providers in the clinic. When the client is better managing their health, what we notice is they gradually stop contacting us and they're contacting the clinic more often. We introduce them to peer specialists if they would like to continue some support. And, and in part, we work with such a socially isolated group of people that what we see is they need help connecting to safe communities. Our peer specialists are very valuable in doing that and can follow through a little bit longer than we can. Next slide, please. Actually, the next two slides are some of the uh, early results from uh, 2013 of our program. And I just wanted to give you an idea that um, we've seen an impact on the clients of the work we're doing, although it both show about a 35% reduction in either hospitalizations and ED visits. What, what we found in our close work with Jeffrey Brenner, who we um, modeled our team on, four years ago is that we can certainly uh, guess there's going to be a 20% regression to the mean. So um, even if we're breaking even, so to speak, in terms of our costs and able to impact reduction of utilization and increase the attendance to primary care, 
um, we feel like we are doing so much uh, to help providers in the community, and that's the feedback we also get, that our support and communication to the primary care clinic about their most difficult population have been incredibly valuable to them. And in fact, a number of comments about pr providing hope to them about patients they've lost hope in. Um, next slide. So that's the RED results, which you can feel free to go and look at um, after my presentation. What I'd say uh, in wrapping up is I think the key elements of our program, we have a, a foundation of a trauma-informed approach and building trust with people. Um, it's client-centered. We start with where the client wants to start with their health goals. We work in collaboration with clinics. Um, we have access to the EMR, and we have a registry that helps us uh, document those psychosocial issues that are going on and that are critical to engaging this population. The registry is very essential in gathering metrics to show our stakeholders and to improve our learning about the population we're working with. Um, and the other caveat is that we're not working on a billable hour. Working on a billable hour, has, I think we can all agree, does not allow for us building a trusting relationship. So we are building, we have time to do this and go at the pace of the client instead of expecting the client to go at our pace. Next slide. Um, these are a couple of videos uh, I have on here that can tell you a little bit more about our program um, and feel free to contact me or ask questions. For more information about this webinar series and other resources, including videos and podcasts, please visit resourcesforintegratedcare.com and follow us on Twitter at integrate underscore care.